No, I mean, I messaged a lot of people the day we bought $250 million yeah. of Bitcoin, and like half of the OGs ignored me. Yeah. But um, I'm on Palm's podcast. He says, you have a question for me. And I said, yeah, yeah. I noticed Jack Dorsey likes Bitcoin. He, he tweets about it. He seems to really appreciate the value of it. He runs a publicly traded company, Square. Do you want to join force with me? Let's go ask Jack if he'll buy some Bitcoin. And Palm goes, that's, that's kind of interesting. And then a few weeks go by, maybe a month go by, and Square announced that they bought Bitcoin. Yep. I okay. Remember. And and that was a game changer. You know, I thought, you know, at the point they did that, you know, I, I thought, we're good now. Bitcoin has reached record highs this year due to two major catalysts, January's spot ETF approval and the recent halving event. As a result, the cryptocurrency has surged over 60% year-to-date and was trading about 6% below its all-time highs reached in March. While these events have propelled Bitcoin's price, they are now behind us, leaving investors searching for the next potential drivers of growth. Analysts point to several factors that could continue to boost Bitcoin's price. Here are four upcoming catalysts. Interest rate cuts. Investors are closely watching the Federal Reserve's outlook on rate cuts, as lower borrowing costs typically lead to rallies in speculative assets like Bitcoin. The ultra-low interest rates in 2021 played a significant role in driving Bitcoin to record highs that year. The rally reversed when the Fed began its monetary tightening campaign. Galaxy CEO Mike Novogratz mentioned that until short-term interest rates decline, Bitcoin will likely trade within a range of $55,000 to $73,000. Shifting regulation. The crypto community is also seeking clarity on the regulatory front, which has often been a hurdle for Bitcoin. The approval of a spot ETF by the Securities and Exchange Commission, spurred by a court ruling, was a significant milestone. Legal sentiment around crypto appears to be evolving, with potential future catalysts including the looming stablecoin bill. Oppenheimer Executive Director Owen Lau suggested to CNBC that this bill could be passed as early as this year. Additionally, the U.S. House of Representatives recently passed a comprehensive regulatory framework for the crypto industry, seen as a win for the sector, although its fate in the Senate remains uncertain. This framework could provide clearer rules for the crypto sphere. So we went on this search and we, and we, you know, considered art and real estate and buying the index and buying big tech companies. And there are regulatory uh, considerations that keep you from just buying securities. You can't have more than 40% of your liquid uh, assets in securities if you're a publicly traded company generally. And so you can't just buy $500 million of SPY. But and even if you did, there's then practical consideration, which is if you told all your investors, we just took all this money and invested in the SPY, their response would be, well, there's nothing special about that. That's the most conventional strategy you could pursue. A 12-year-old could do the same, give us the capital back. So we discovered uh, the idea of gold, and then we thought about it. We decided the digital gold would be better than gold. If we could get all the benefits of a non-sovereign store of value, bearer instrument that's uh, hard money, and if we could combine it with all the benefits of Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, a big tech global dominant network, putting the idea of technology investing with the idea of, of hard money investing together in the year 2024, it struck us as being a reasonable strategy. And at the time, it was really the only reasonable strategy. We're, we're either going to give the money back to the shareholders, and that's a fast death. Give the money back, decapitalize, have no assets. Right? Once you lose your financial capital, you're going to lose your human capital. Because if you have no money on the balance sheet, and if your business has no volatility, the options have no value, stock options have no value, you can't, afford, you can't overpay the employees, you don't have the cash. And so you're probably going to lose the employees, and then three to six years later, the product's not going to be competitive. So the fast death wasn't all that appealing. If you're going to do that, you might as well just sell the company. Mm. The slow death is set on $600 million in cash, which yeah, we could, we could run at an operating loss for 20 years with that much cash, but you're just waiting to die. right? It's like you're not going to beat Microsoft and Amazon and Facebook and Google. That's like holding up in your citadel 
while the army's outside, they're just going to starve you to death. And okay, I've got seven years of food in my citadel, but while I'm sitting here and for seven years, they're going to burn all my fields, you know, <laughs> damn my water supply and take over the rest of the world. And when I come out in seven years, people will have forgotten me. So that's no good. So the last thing is you go, you ride out of the citadel, you take a risk, you know, pick sides, join the fray, uh, you know, take a decision. And at the time, you know, the, the obvious uh, team to join was Team Bitcoin. <laughs> the obvious movement was the crypto movement. And there was a lot of risk, but, but the alternative was just a, either a slow or fast death. Um, I'm not surprised and I'm not disappointed with what we've achieved in four years. I mean, we did, I, I think there has been a sentiment shift throughout the Bitcoin community to, to look uh, further in the future. You know, uh, I think there has been a positive sentiment shift in media, you know, on, on, in the financial, you know, television networks. It used to be people lamented, nobody talked about Bitcoin or they talked to this scammy. And I think, I think we legitimized Bitcoin as an asset class with CNBC and Bloomberg and Fox. And I think, um, I think a lot of private companies you know, uh, got very heavily involved. I get, I get letters from, from people that are private investors. And also everywhere I go, I meet somebody that says, oh, I watched one of your videos and I, you know, I finally got Bitcoin. And I started buying heavily. So a lot of private investors, a lot of families, a lot of private companies. <laughs> and, you know, like my first podcast with Palm, you know, he always had this question at the end of the day, he'd ask a question. He goes, do you, and I watched his previous podcast and I noticed he always says, so do you have a question for me? And I looked at that and I thought, yeah, I'm going to have a question for him. Yeah. I mean, I messaged a lot of people that they bought $250 million yeah. of Bitcoin and like half of the OGs ignored me. Yeah. But um, I'm on Palm's podcast. He says, you have a question for me. And I said, yeah, yeah. I noticed Jack Dorsey likes Bitcoin. He, he tweets about it. He seems to really appreciate the value of it. He runs a publicly traded company, Square. Do you want to join force with me? Let's go ask Jack if he'll buy some Bitcoin. And Punk goes, that's, that's kind of interesting. And then a few weeks go by, maybe a month go by, and Square announced that they bought Bitcoin. Yep, I okay? remember. And, and that was a game changer. You know, I thought, you know, at the point they did that, you know, I, I thought, we're good now. We're yeah. going to win.